Hello and welcome to another episode of Brand Retro. Today's guest is Maria Brito, award-winning art advisor, author, and curator. Maria hosts her own TV series on PBS and has written for publications such as Elle Magazine, Huffington Post, and Entrepreneur. Maria, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Mike. Thank you for having me. And hello, everyone who's listening. Thank you for being here. I'm so excited to share this time with you all. Yeah, so I am, I'm pumped about a lot of topics when it comes to you. The first is... I love the the whole idea of creativity for entrepreneurs. I like the fact that part of your job and part of your mission is to extract and cultivate that creativity. So tell us a little bit about that process and what you do to help people get out of that comfortable space and get- Mike, 13 years ago, I left a successful career as a corporate attorney where I was extremely miserable. I learned a thing or two about building a business and I also learned a thing or two about creativity because I decided to open a company in the space of the art world, the fine arts, and that was a complete departure from being a corporate attorney for, I, I was an attorney for nine years in New York wow. in big and small and medium law firms. And I graduated from Harvard Law School, no less. I'm not saying this to brag. I'm saying this so that people understand what the things that were at stake when I actually said I am moving away from this and from all the money that I was making as an attorney and from all the bonuses and the perks. And it's really, it is a very stable and solid career unless you are committing fraud. It's very unusual that you're ever going to lose your job as an attorney. It's one of the very few things that are still very much needed, and especially in New York City in the arena of corporations and banks, which were the clients that that law firm had and I served. So I I wanted to do something that was meaningful to me. And I had always been very passionate about visual arts and artists. And I grew up in a family that did not believe that could be a job, but they believed that could be a hobby or something that people do for nurturing their souls and whatnot. So I learned a lot of art growing up because my parents would take me to galleries and museums and the we were not rich or anything, but the money that was a surplus, it was always for cultural activities or to send me away on a trip to see other cultures and to learn things. And you always learn about art and artists when you are traveling. At least that's what my parents put in my, like the seed they planted. And that's what I did. So I decided that it was, that was the path that I was going to follow because I had been going to galleries in New York while I was working as an attorney. And I also had been advising some friends on what type of artist to acquire and invest. And I was I was finding young talents who became fame and the money that my client my friends had spent was basically growing. And that was before Instagram and before all these things where people find it's, it's so easy nowadays. Or if people think it is easy. So I became obsessed with this idea of creativity because I realized that what really makes a company and a business stand out is the uniqueness of the owners and the ideas that the team brings to, you know, the marketplace. And it has nothing to do with your background, if you're an attorney or if you're a doctor, if you're a dentist or whatever profession you decide to pursue, the it, you can apply creativity to any of those things. And since I was working in the space of the arts, I got to really know more than 450 contemporary artists from that time 13 years ago up until today. And I realized that these artists, not only are they successful and rich and vastly innovative, but I realized that they operate in the exact same way that entrepreneurs do. And so how I, I decided that I wanted to work in the space, not only as an art advisor, but also I have a consulting division in my business that helps companies and individuals innovate and come up with better ideas in a very straightforward way. I hate complexity. I think complexity is the enemy of execution. And I like to be able to give these concepts to anybody so that anybody can apply them to their lives and their careers. And it has nothing to do with learning how to cut and paint and arts and crafts. and all. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with habits, simple habits, and incorporating them into your life on a daily basis. 
<laughs> so a couple things. I just, I, first of all, I love the fact that you started down a career path. You chose a path, you were successful at it, you were doing a good job, and you were in, in many ways, probably out of that entrepreneurial mode because you'd already carved your path and you were on it. And at some point, something changed, right? You decided, hey, I don't love this anymore. Or something's different. Something's changed. What do I love? Should I chase that? I say that because I had a very similar fall from grace, so to speak, or a change in my career because I just wasn't having fun anymore and I didn't want to do it. And I really didn't care about what the out outcome was other than I wanted to do something for myself. I wanted to take a chance. And I truly believed that similar to you, that if I'm creative and driven and, and do some of these different things, it's just going to turn out the way I want it to, or it's going to figure itself out. So my model, which I love is so close to what you're talking about, is that I believe you, I agree with you. Uh, cre creativity can be applied anywhere. And when I work with entrepreneurs, very similar to yourself, Sometimes my goal or passion is to try to squeeze that out of them where they don't think they necessarily have it to give themselves not only a creative outcome, but an authentic outcome. So if they're doing something that's creative and authentic to them, it can't be wrong, right? It, you can't fail, but you have to package it up. You have to do something with it. You have to figure out how to polish that reality and make it work for your business. Again, very similar to what you're talking about. That is how I, I translate it on my side is helping clients and customers and people be creative where maybe they didn't have the confidence to be creative, but then helping them package that up and Paul. You said it. I think that I was never really happy being an attorney, but once you are in all the you know, myths of things and uh, you've already gone through the education and you have passed the bar, such a prestigious things. And I don't know what kind of bullshit is around all that. And then you've been working for a while and it's almost like you make this automatic pilot thing that says, this is what I do. It really is solid. I make so much money and I must continue doing it because it's sort of like it enslaves you a little by little and then more and more. But my identity was not that. Actually, I'm the one right now, the Maria Brito that emerged from the dark ages of the law firms is the real person. And back then I was a facade of what my parents thought or society. Like there are so many stupid things that people tell you and that they don't really know is their own projections. And this is the prestigious thing to do. This is the dependable thing to do. This is what the good girls do, right? Or whatever, or the good boys. And it's just not only outdated, but it's totally wrong. I, I think that my parents didn't understand who I was. They meant, obviously, they were my parents. They were really good people to me, but they didn't understand who I was. They tried to prepare me for the world that they lived in, not for the world that I actually stepped into. And I just decided that I was not going to, my life was slipping through my fingers and I decided that I was not going to let that happen anymore. And uh, I was 32 when I left or 33. I had been, I had graduated very young, so I had been practicing for a while, but I ne it never occurred to me that I couldn't do it. it. It was like, I am going to step into the person that I am with absolutely every talent and every shortcoming, all of them. I'm going to just jump into this new thing. And there is absolutely no plan B either. This got to work because I've already done something that I hate for so long. And I have that part of my life. It's like a blur. I don't even want to remember it, I think. And I am, or I actually remember when I think that could exist or that could be a part of my life i'm like let me just work a little harder so that i never have that option i even let my my you work so freaking hard to pass that bar exam and i let that thing lapse because i don't take the requirements every year to keep it afloat or whatever but the point is that if i could do it anybody can i didn't really have any got parents or a sugar daddy or a trust fund i had savings yes because i worked really hard as an attorney I had a one sheet business plan because I knew already that a 60 page business plan was not going to do anything. And I also had, to, I think that my greatest asset, honestly, was that I was an outsider. Because when you are an expert and you have seen everything, 
you tend to develop a lot of blind spots. Unless you're a doctor, of course, like we want doctors to be super expert. But once you are in an industry for too long, things start to become business as usual. And unless you are extremely creative and curious and, and look, this happens to the best people, really, unless you are one of those kind of people who keep pushing your boundaries and yourself and are a real entrepreneur, you are going to start getting comfortable because you already know how to do something. And once you get comfortable, you get in the, in, in the fantastic world of efficiency. So you do things faster, better. And then it comes to the point where you are in a plateau, perhaps creatively, maybe the business is doing well, but then what? And so what I have observed is once people get very comfortable and they get to that level where things like smooth sailing and whatever, boom, something happens and like the business starts suffering, the numbers start getting down because you were not wanting to innovate and to partake of the new things that are happening in the world. And you have to meet your clients, your audience, or your wanted audience or clients where they are. It's not the other way around. They don't come to meet you where you are. You have to go and meet them where they are. And that requires a consistent shift. That doesn't mean that one day you're going to sell bananas and the next day you're going to be selling software. What it means is that you do have to have the willingness to dig into your creative faculties and your skills and see what you can change, see the things that you can add, the things that are adjacent. I love adjacencies and people miss on that so much, right? There are so many opportunities to make money, to have fun opportunities and fulfillment in those spaces where your industry is touching another one and merging with another one or is just close to it. And so many people are so rigid. We do this. <laughs> and then and they sort of like miss on those things. Yeah. And I I personally like I'm a little bit left brain, little bit right brain. So I have the luxury of kind of jumping in between, but I get a real charge and excitement out of finding opportunities where people have already looked. I like reinventing how we're going to do things, not for the sake of just reinventing, but for looking for stuff we might have missed the first time around. And because anytime I agree with you, anytime things get too routine, you're getting flat. If you're doing it over and over again, the exact same way, you can only then respect, expect the same results. And I don't think in a creative industry like we're in or what I'm, I don't think that's necessarily good enough. And I don't think that's necessarily what the clients are paying you for. They're, they're paying you to be creative, innovate, and, and to think of the things that they didn't or couldn't or whatever you want to say. And I agree with you wholeheartedly that it's important that not only listeners, but people who want to embrace this kind of mindset, just the idea is just don't ever get too comfortable because because you want a certain level of chaos and, and discomfort and you want to chase that piece because that's where the new stuff develops. And you want to also be able to follow your heart. And so every time that I've had a notch to explore something, if it was reasonable, I would go and check, right? Like. I have taken projects in manufacturing, even though that's not my main thing. And I did it for two years and I learned a ton. I hated it too, because you're dealing with way too many variables and like factories that don't do the thing on time. And then you have to sell through retailers that don't pay on time and whatnot. I did that in collaboration with artists. It was fantastic, really. And to the extent that Today, companies still call me to consult for them on manufacturing products in collaboration with artists for limited editions. And sometimes I help, sometimes I don't. It depends on what my life is. But what I'm saying is that every time I've felt a desire to explore something, that it is, that it, it's, it expands not only my point of view, but my expertise and that of my business, and it builds my brand. I'm absolutely going to go and check because that is like the reason why I did not want to be an attorney anymore. And that's also the reason why I opened a company that is foundationally on the world of ideas and creativity and creative thinking and artists and innovation and in any field fascinated 
not only about how artists think, but I am also fascinated by entrepreneurs like you, like Elon Musk, like Steve Jobs. I honestly think that what they have and what they did and what they do is not that far from what, it's just what areas you decided to get into and what kind of lifestyle you wanted to have. Because I mean, it is a very different thing to be solo or to have a small team. And then you go, if you really want to build something like Steve Jobs did, you know that you are going to have to manage people, that they are also going to hate you like they hated him and then they loved him. But, and that you're going to have to get into a lot of contracts with a lot of debt and a lot of like all sorts of things happen or don't happen depending on your level of comfort with risk and what you want to take on for you. And I have talked to a lot of people who have told me oh, I had an opportunity to do this big business, but honestly, I like my life. A lot of millennials and Jesus, you know what? Choices. I don't really want to be like working that much. And I'm okay if I just have to live the rest of my life in this studio apartment because that's what they decided to do, right? So I think these opportunities that the people have to in, reinvent themselves or to create something of value for the world are very much attainable to anybody who just wants to work on building creative habits daily. And th those habits are things that anybody can do. The truth is, and that's why I wrote my book, because I wanted to demystify the creative process and I wanted to give people a blueprint on how to assemble these parts of creativity for themselves and, and realize that really it's not wizardry. It's not something that is a God-given talent. It is simply an amalgamation of skills. Right. And you'll get a kick out of this, and I'm sure you've heard this before, is that I get the comment a lot from clients or, you know, even people that I know that, that will say, I'm not that creative. I can't even draw stick figures or that kind of stuff. <laughs> and to me, that's just a misunderstanding of what creativity is, because I know people that they might be a blue crawler worker who works with steel that is highly creative. He just doesn't give himself that label. Creative has always been associated to drawing, to art, to whatever. And it's more than that. It's problem solving. It's how you look at different scenarios or, or problems. It's creativity is, to me is more of a, a visionary slash mindset that most people, if they could figure out how to harness it or how to pull it together at will and use it to their advantage, most people are creative in some way. They just don't necessarily give themselves that credit. And I would be curious to hear your thoughts on this, but like with my business, I am an entrepreneur at heart and I enjoy that aspect of it, but there's a creative selfishness in me that I want to create something unique every time I do it. I don't necessarily want to replicate what was a, the perfect mousetrap. I want to rebuild that mousetrap to catch more mice. Like I want to rethink it. I want to make it more creative. I want to make it more fun. And there's a part of it that's, it's a goal for me to get to that deliverable for my clients, but there's a selfishness in me that just, that's fun for me. I like to, I like <laughs> to feed that side of me that reinvents it and makes it fun because that's why I'm doing this. That's why I left my career to do this. That's what it's all about for me. And, and luckily for me, it works for the customer and myself, but there, there's a part of it that it's just in me that I want to do it different for the sake of doing it better, different, more unique, more creative, and do it in a way that separates myself from the status. There's so much to unpack in what you said that I don't even know uh, where to tackle it. But to begin with, yes, the concept of creativity has been misappropriated because people think it belongs to artists alone. And the, the etymology of the word creativity comes from the word creo in Greek, which means to make, right? And that after years and centuries, it was more and more associated with artists because at that time, people who made things were the artisans, people who made things with their hands. You had philosophers in, on squares, right? Like Socrates and Plato, like they were just talking. And then you had the other ones who were doing things with their hands. And so that's where it evolved and it became that. And um, in the 1700s, it was the first time the word creativity appeared in the English language. And it's because this guy was writing about Shakespeare and he said, and Shakespeare is a creative genius. And so this is the beginning of why we associate creativity with the arts or 
you know, with, with writers and fiction and whatnot. But the truth is that creativity is your unique ability to come up with ideas of value for your business or career, no matter what you do. And they have to be relevant because what I said before, you have to meet the market where it is today and not the one yesterday. So anybody can do that. And I claim that people have to actually embrace this for themselves as much as any other characteristics that they are proud of, like the drive and the desire to keep going and keep doing things for their business. And marketing is a creative skill and no business can survive without marketing that I know of. Like maybe you know of one, but I personally don't, right? I love also what you said about being a little selfish, but I think that you are not being selfish. On the contrary, you're serving your clients better because the more you allow yourself to explore, the more you allow yourself to deconstruct things and to look at them from different angles, reassemble the pieces, the more value you're giving to them. And I personally also believe that the greatest entrepreneurs, in fact, being an entrepreneur is being creative because you have already bet on an idea that comes from you that you think is better than what exists, or that you can do it better, that you can actually bring something to the market that brings value that you have something so unique that nobody else can emulate. And if they emulate it, then you move on to the next thing. I mean, within your business and you refine it and you keep evolving and growing in that sense. Without ideas, there is no progress, right? Like I don't, there's, there is no way that we can keep moving forward if we don't have ideas. If we didn't have companies like in technology and if we didn't have companies that make cars and planes and things like that, right? Now we have people who go to outer space. And years ago, this whole thing of being on a podcast that we can look at each other and we're on two extremes of the country, whatever, it would have been laughable. So all these things are actually started all with a very small idea on like literally on the fringes of what was the mainstream at the moment. And people decided whether or not they wanted to adopt them, if they wanted to tweak them, if they wanted to play with them if they wanted to recombine them with something else that they had thought about or seen before. So I think that the concept of entrepreneurship and business has to be married to creativity or else it's just not exciting and it's I don't see it viable in the long term. Right and I'm sure you've seen this in your past as well but I've been in networking groups and I've been in different circles where I can just tell they're a, they're a routine entrepreneur. They're, they saw so-and-so had a business. They replicated that model and they're just going down that path to nothing wrong with it, but they're going down that path to achieve a flat existence and a flat lifestyle that mirrors something else where for me, and I think for a lot of people who get into this, the whole thing is that entrepreneurship for me was about moving the ball forward. Now, how far that goes, I have no idea. All I know is that as long as I keep doing this, I want to keep moving the ball forward every year, every month, every week, every day, till it's till I just can't move it any further. And I just I don't know if that's even possible as long as I keep thinking about it like that and being aggressive in the space of creativity and trying to always drive forward with creativity. Creativity is inexhaustible. And people are like, how can that be? It, it turns out that, first of all, it's only something that humans do. Other living species are not creative the way that we are. And they can solve problems, but they are not creative in the application of those ideas. The other thing is, for example, energy has, there's only so much we can do and we have to go to sleep, whatever it is. For some people, that's two hours. For other people, that's eight or 12, whatever. But what energy is limited. Creativity is not. And that's why you have Apple is not anymore on the Apple than the iPhone number one or in the Lisa like 30 years ago. It's already like manufacturing cars. And that's why filmmakers are not just stuck in the first thing they did. Like it, that, that's why you have Ridley Scott is not doing the same thing he was doing 30, 40 years ago. It's because creativity is inexhaustible. And the more you work at it, the more it multiplies, and that is absolutely true 
I have seen that myself in my business. I have seen it with my friends, artists. I have seen it with my friends who run successful businesses, the ones who are creative directors in, in like big brands or in, an, in ad agencies and things like that, is that the more you work at it and the more ideas you have, you build that momentum where they keep coming back to you. These ideas keep coming back and you keep building on them. So in the sense of what you say, how much can I push this ball forward? That is totally up to you. It is like your desire to keep actually doing great things is commendable because we talked about this. You don't want to end up flat. You don't want to just repeating yourself or repeating others. You just want to keep evolving. And what is interesting is sometimes people come and say, but what do you really do? And I think that's it's flattering in a way because I do so many things. And once something does not perform or doesn't bring me any joy, sometimes as a business owner, it hurts to have to kill a project. It hurts to have to kill a division, right? Like it, that, those things bother me. But it bothers me more when they are not really doing what they are meant to do. And so I feel like much better off if I just like, this is not working anymore. Let me just move, even if it takes me a little bit to accept it, than just staying stuck. And that's part of being an entrepreneur. And as much as it is being an artist, is having that quality of being nimble, right? Like you don't have to really ask for permission for too many people. You don't have a lot of bureaucracy to respond to. You can actually take the shifts and pivots. And look, big companies can do that too. Look at Netflix, right? Look at what, like they are now trying to get into the world of gaming too, because actually I think they are haunted by the blockbuster story, for example. It's like blockbuster could have even bought Netflix at some point. They said, we're not interested. We're the, the, we're the leaders in the at-home entertainment thing. We are the best. Look at all the physical locations. Our assets are worth this and that. And they're gone with the wind, right? Like they are really gone. And then you have a very large company like Netflix it is today. And they are not just like, we are great at delivering the content and supplying it to our fanatics and creating it originally and doing all this. It was like a progression of things, right? Or like in, in the beginning, it was just like, it was DVDs that would get to your mail every month. And then it was like, this is not working out so well. Let's do streaming. And it was like shocking, but people were like, let's play along. And then you took a long time to understand what the business model was and where are they getting all those money and this and that. And then it was like, and now we're studios too. And now we're producing the original series and we have the rights to distribute that. And we're going to show them in the big screen and we're going to play at the Oscars. And now it's, and we're going to do gaming too, because they know that Gen Z is all about gaming. It's all about the metaverse. And they don't know exactly how that's going to play out, but they are going to play out. And that is, it's an example of a company that is large, but nimble. And I think that to the extent that is within anybody's control keep experimenting and to keep exploring they should do it they should do it because honestly the way that we have been living in the past 10 years and it just accelerates it's just faster and faster and i know it's impossible for anybody to be at the same speed as all these things are happening but you can really be um you can really be to willing to reevaluate your business at least once a year and to see what are the opportunities that you have. And this is available for everybody. What are the opportunities that you have to upgrade, pivot, shift, tweak, pot, reinvent, re-show what you're doing? And I, even if it's just, sometimes it could just be your marketing strategy. Sometimes it could be just like being an early adopter of a social media platform that you were very afraid of. TikTok could say things like that. But, uh, but all those little things build momentum. And this is what sometimes people are unable to see because they are not getting the, the Series A $10 million capital injection. They are like, oh man, and it didn't happen. But like actually the little things that you do every day for the business whether it is adopting TikTok or writing a special, you know, part of your business plan that you had the idea and seeing how, if, if it's possible to implement 
those little things are cumulative and they usually turn out to build some sort of momentum for you to take the next step. Yeah, it's any of my clients who are, are listening to this are going to probably chuckle because the word momentum, the word compounding momentum, whether it's talking about being nimble, keeping an open mind to evolution, like all of these things, I couldn't agree with you more. And you're actually making this difficult for me to even ask questions because you're just, when you talked a little bit about even when people say, what do you do? I think at its core, yeah, I can give you the generic or traditional answer, but even for me, and I, I don't mean this as a smart ass, but this has been my answer since the beginning is when people go, what do you do? My answer is always whatever it takes. That's my answer. Yes, I do marketing. Yes, I do logos. Yes, I do brand creative. But the real answer is whatever it takes, because I'm here to evolve. I'm here to pivot. I'm here to be nimble and I'm here to do something different. And all of those other things that we talked about that are service level, those are just the vehicles I need to get there. But really what I do is create. And that's where I think it's fun for people who embrace that mindset because it's liberating. When you get to that point where you don't feel pressured to answer the traditional question in the traditional way, you can then start to really see who you are and where this thing can go. Yes. And you have to build a trust and confidence that your ideas are good. That's another thing that... It, it, I, I think it's, it's such a poisonous thought that your ideas are not good, that they are not good enough, that what if I put this out and it flops and you're never not going to know unless you put it out. So many wonderful ideas die before seeing the light of day because entrepreneurs and business people, even in companies, they self-censor themselves because of fear of not really measuring up or coming up short, whatever it is that, and, and these things are normally self-imposed limitations that have nothing to do with what's happening out in the world. And they have nothing to do with what your boss is going to say, or your investors or whatever. It, it has to really do a lot with, with how much conviction you have in your own ideas. And obviously, there are a lot of different processes by which people can evaluate their ideas and prioritize them. Some people have way too many ideas and they don't know which ones to choose. And so many people are like, I have no ideas. I, I just like did not come with any idea, which I don't think is true. I think that it's mostly that they are expecting to come up with the cure to cancer to say something. And, and that's not really the expectation for the most part. Every time you make incremental innovation, it's just to make something better for each one of the services or products that you're offering each time. And it's just a little bit, right? And, it's, and it, you need that little bit. That's why, again, like for, I think it's just such an easy example to think about Apple, right? They just did not stay with the iPhone, the one that was launched in 2007 or 8 or whatever it was. It was like, and let's do iPhone 2. And then the incremental innovations that iPhone 2 had build a path for the 3 and so on. They couldn't have gone from the 1 to the 13 plus in one take because a lot of the things were not available a lot of people did not understand how to make those things happen. But now because one thing paved the way for the other, then the rest is possible. And I think that is the same for a dentist, for an accountant, for any professional who would want to really stand out in their fields and be perceived as unique, have a brand that is memorable, brand themselves in their marketing efforts, in their business efforts. Everything has to be congruent, if you will. Everything has to make sense from that point of view. But these are these attributes are really things that anybody can really do. That's the truth. It's not a special thing. It's it's is um, it's just a desire, right? Is is that it's like that little fire. And in fact, the the number one prerequisite for people to really embrace an identity or a habit, or a new concept that they want to incorporate in their lives is willingly. The word willingly is so important. And the, the first person who actually made the discovery of neuroplasticity, that the brain changes very well into adulthood, no matter you know the age, if you keep doing something, that person said, 
the only prerequisite is that you want to do this. And I, it sounds simple, but a lot of people put a lot of resistance. So it's a different story, right? Yeah. A huge part of it is just a couple of things. First of all, believing in yourself, but also taking the chance and being okay with it not working out. Like maybe you want to learn how to play guitar because you think it'd be fun and you give it a try and six months into it, you're like, I don't enjoy this. And you just quit and move on. Nothing wrong with that. It doesn't mean you failed. It actually means you succeeded because you, now you don't like playing guitar. But if you never take that chance, if you never really look at it with those arms wide open approach, you're never going to know. And it's always going to be one of those things that's on your list that you're never going to get to. And eventually it, it'll just turn into a regret, which you don't. I wrote in my book that people have to evaluate failures as, as projects and ideas that fail. It's not a personal thing, right? And when you separate yourself from the, the act and the, and, and the moment when something failed in your business, it's not you, it's the idea. And I think that is very groundbreaking for a lot of the people who go to my course or a lot of the people who actually I have taught these concepts in companies in person. It's because they actually step like back and say, but that's true. The f I know that entrepreneurship is very personal because you put your name on a business and you give your heart and soul into something. And it, obviously, as I said before, things hurt when they don't work out, but it's not you who failed. Is a particular product, is a particular idea, is a project. And failures pave the way for success because hopefully you learned what didn't work out that time around. Hopefully, like when I was telling you that I ventured into manufacturing as an extra part, it's not that I stopped doing the advisory, it's that I wanted to get into the business of manufacturing because it allowed me to work with super famous artists in limited edition products. I learned so much. But so much, and I have like now very solid idea on how to produce things and the, not only what are the questions to ask to a factory, but like the terminology, like people are like, she knows what she's talking about. And when I had decided that I didn't want to do it anymore, it felt a little bit like a failure because I was like, gee, we got like all this press. We were in the Wall Street Journal and Vogue and whatever. And now I'm like, I'm actually not doing it anymore. But I was like, you know what? It's okay. I like allowed it to be for two years. We actually made money, but the headaches were tremendous. And I really don't feel that uh, my, my time should be wasted fighting with factories because they missed deadlines. And those experiences and that credibility just gets applied to whatever it is you're going to do next. So yeah, it's a chapter that's closed and some might look at it as a failure, even though it's not. But what you got from that is priceless because you're, you can then apply that to, to whatever comes next. Yes. Nothing goes wasted. No experience is ever just in a vacuum that doesn't have any application. Everything that you do in your life will have something of value to give to you at some point or another. No, I completely agree. And, and to be honest, this has just been one of the best interviews ever. So. I appreciate you coming on, Maria. I'm going to wrap it up with that, but thank you so much. And thank and tell us a little bit about where they can find you and how they can connect. Yes, MariaBrita.com, B-R-I-T-O.com is my website. And there are links to social media. There is an email form if you want to fill that out and get in touch with me. My book is called How Creativity Rules the World. And the topic, of course, is Creativity for Everyone is published by HarperCollins out on March 15th. So it's already on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, IndieBound, Bookshop.org, Target, Walmart, and all the independent stores across the United States. And I think it's, obviously I'm biased. I think it's a wonderful book. But what I think is, is quite fun and interesting is that it gives you a whole blueprint on how to become more creative and at the end of each chapter i made it highly actionable so i'm giving you exercises and steps to follow so that everything that is in the chapter doesn't just stay as in the chapter but it actually comes to life in what you're doing and this I know it works because it is foundational for when I teach in companies and the workshops that I give. So I know these things work, but obviously 
It's not by having the book next to you. They work if you actually do the exercises and that you apply them to your life. And I can guarantee you, you're going to have so many breakthroughs if you do. Thank you for sharing that information. And I will, I will make an effort to put those links within the show notes too, so people can easily find it. So thank you again. Congratulations on the book. Good luck to you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. It's been my pleasure. And thank you for your time. If you'd like to learn more about CyberDogs, share your thoughts, or even ask a specific question about this episode and or the brand retro mindset, contact me directly at mike at cyberdogsmarketing.com.